patriarch Jacob, or Israel, is about to be gathered to his ancestors. So we'll hear about his death and burial. But then the brothers of Joseph wonder if his charity towards them will change once their father has passed. So how does our story end? Greetings and welcome. This last section of Genesis ties up some loose ends as we hear about the deaths of both Jacob and Joseph. We will also have some of the themes of the book summed up as we consider the relationship between the tribes of Israel. And finally, we end on a bit of a cliffhanger. To be continued. As they remain in Egypt and not in the land that they were promised. And so let's begin by hearing Jacob's last words and the account of his death. May the Lord bless us in the reading of the sacred text. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said about them as he bade them farewell and gave to each of them an appropriate message. Then he gave them this charge. Since I am about to be taken to my kindred, bury me with my fathers in the cave that lies in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, facing on Mamre, in the land of Canaan, the field that Abraham bought from Ephron the Hittite for a burial ground. There Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried, and so are Isaac and his wife Rebekah, and there too I buried Leah, the field and the cave in it that had been purchased from the Hittites. When Jacob had finished giving these instructions to his sons, he drew his feet into his bed, breathed his last, and was taken to his kindred. We begin with a conclusion and a bit of exposition on the blessings that we had heard about last time. Also, because each of the sons is considered the head of their family, the blessing was not just for them, but was for their entire tribe or all of the descendants that would come after them. And even those whose blessing seems to be more like curses were still considered blessed because they would still share in the covenant that God had promised and they had made with their ancestors. But also, if we are including Ephraim and Manasseh in this list, why do we still come up with 12? First we don't got enough, now we got too many. To get to the number 12, sometimes Simeon is omitted, and Ephraim and Manasseh take the place of Joseph. In other lists, such as in Numbers, Simeon is retained, but Levi is omitted as his tribe does not inherit land, but becomes the priestly tribe. Either way, the number 12 is symbolic in the sense that all the descendants are considered part of the promise. The blessing of the 12 sons acts as an indication that the promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is on its way to fulfillment at least half the promise. The part about the land still remains to be seen at this point in our story. And then we have the instructions that Jacob gives his sons concerning his burial. And this follows a common Hebrew literary device in which certain phrases or ideas are repeated with different words. And we see this quite often in the wisdom literature. And we are told why he must be buried back in the promised land with his ancestors. Both we, the reader, and his children have no doubt heard the story before, but it serves to make it explicit where he is to be buried so that his kids don't get it wrong. It also adds a few new details, for this is the first that we hear that Rebecca and Leah are also buried there. Rachel, of course, had to be buried on the road between Bethel and Ephrath. But while it is important to Jacob that he be buried with his ancestors, he didn't believe the physical proximity of his body to them affected his spiritual presence with them. It is worth noting that when he dies, the scripture tells us that he was gathered to his people at that time. This refers to the moment of death and not the burial. Ultimately, it did not matter where the body was buried. His spirit would already be with his ancestors. The next few verses tell us about the passing of Jacob as well as his funeral preparation. And this also gives us some insight into some of the customs of the ancient Egyptians. Joseph threw himself on his father's face and wept over him as he kissed him. Then he ordered the physicians in his service to embalm his father. When they embalmed Israel, they spent 40 days at it, for that is the full period of embalming. And the Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. When that period of mourning was over, Joseph spoke to Pharaoh's courtiers. Please do me this favor, he said, and convey to Pharaoh this request of mine. Since my father, at the point of death, made me promise an oath to bury him in the tomb that he had prepared for himself in the land of Canaan, may I go up there to bury my father and then come back? Pharaoh replied, Go and bury your father, as he made you promise an oath. Throughout this story, we have witnessed the love that Joseph has for his family. And we see this once again in a show of affection as he weeps over his father. Remember, he hadn't seen him for most of his adult life. And since Joseph was a high-ranking Egyptian official, he had access to the best embalmers to prepare his father for burial. In fact, many historians believe that the embalmers also cared for their clients in life as well, acting as a type of physician. Such a process of embalming took 40 days, 
and they continued to mourn for an additional 30 days, for a total of 70 days. While these numbers match some of the symbolic numbers that we have observed before, they also match with what is known about the practices of embalmment in ancient Egypt. Mummies have their brains pulled out through their nose. Not the direction I was going, but it was an interesting procedure. But since death and burial were considered spiritual matters, the length of time that they took to do these things was significant, and it was even liturgical in practice. When it comes time for the burial, it is interesting that Joseph does not speak to Pharaoh directly, but rather through his household, which may seem odd given their close relationship. However, this does make sense when you consider the Hebrew customs of mourning. Joseph would not have shaved nor have been adorned in appropriate attire. It would have been uncustomary for a mourner to enter into the presence of Pharaoh. As expected, Pharaoh does give Joseph permission to go and bury his father. But then, something unexpected happens. Let's continue reading. So Joseph left to bury his father, and with him went all of Pharaoh's officials who were senior members of his court and all the other dignitaries of Egypt as well as Joseph's whole household, his brothers and his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in the region of Goshen. Chariots too and charioteers went up with him. It was a very large retinue. When they arrived at Goran Ha Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they held there a very great and solemn memorial service. And Joseph observed seven days of mourning for his father. When the Canaanites who inhabited the land saw the mourning at Goran Ha Atad, they said, this is a solemn funeral the Egyptians are having. That is why the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus Jacob's sons did for him as he had instructed them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, facing on Mamre, the field that Abraham had bought for a burial ground from Ephron the Hittite. After Joseph had buried his father, he returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all who had gone up with him for the burial of his father. So not only does the family of Jacob turn up for the funeral, which would be expected, but many of the Egyptian officials and elders and dignitaries also accompany them for a grand funeral procession. Now this shows the great respect and honor that everyone showed Joseph in Egypt. Also, it is interesting that there were chariots and horsemen that accompanied them as well, which would be unusual considering what we know about the customs of funeral processions but they would have most likely been there for protection. Those in the surrounding nations are well aware of Egypt's wealth at this point, mostly due to Joseph's policies, so they would likely need to have an armed escort. This also may be a bit of foreshadowing, as we see them in contrast to the horsemen and chariots that will chase the Hebrews when they leave Egypt many generations later. In terms of the route that they took to get to Hebron, there seems to be some confusion with the geography. And while some apologists have tried to reconcile this in saying that they would have taken the long route around in order to get there due to perhaps the weather or bandits and that they would have arrived beyond the Jordan, this does seem unlikely. And it is made very clear to the tomb that they are going to, the one in Machpelah that was bought from Ephron the Hittite. But the names of these locations are significant and they suggest the importance of showing that the Egyptians were part of the procession and that they wept and mourned with the family of Joseph and Jacob. And as was the custom, they mourned him for an additional seven days. When they finally do get to the place of burial, it would be understood that the last part of the procession ceremony and burial probably was only attended by the family of Israel, as we are told. Here, they might mourn and pray according to their own customs and lay his body with those who had gone before him. And so, Joseph has fulfilled his promise to his father, just as God has continued to fulfill his promises to him. But when they all return to Egypt, his brothers begin to feel uneasy about their future, now that their father is gone. Remember that Esau had planned to kill his brother, but decided to wait until after Isaac had died. The brothers of Joseph may be thinking something similar may happen here. So now we will have the final plea of his brothers, a reassurance of forgiveness, and a summary of Joseph's story. Now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful and thought, Suppose Joseph has been nursing a grudge against us, and now plans to pay us back in full for all the wrong we did him. So they approached Joseph and said, Before your father died, he gave us these instructions. You shall say to Joseph, Jacob begs you to forgive the criminal wrongdoing of your brothers, who treated you so cruelly. Please, therefore, forgive the crime that we, the servants of your father's God, committed. When they spoke these words to him, Joseph broke into tears. Then his brothers proceeded to fling themselves down before him and said, Let us be your slaves. But Joseph replied to them, Have no fear. 
Can I take the place of God? Even though you meant harm to me, God meant it for good, to achieve his present end, the survival of many people. Therefore, have no fear. I will provide for you and for your children. By thus speaking kindly to them, he reassured them. Now his brothers begin this plea by telling Joseph that it was their father's dying wish that he forgive them. Now we don't know if this is true or not because this was not recorded. However, it would make sense that Jacob would not want his sons to continue fighting after his death. But on the other hand, it would make sense for his brothers to lie to him. I mean, this was certainly a family trait. Either way, it does continue with the theme of forgiveness and unity that we've been seeing you know, throughout this part of the story. Joseph, of course, gets emotional and reassures his family that all is well. Even if they deserved punishment, Joseph leaves that to God alone. And this is an interesting comment that shows Joseph's humility. For the Egyptians, he may have been seen as a god, if not close to one, due to his status. But Jacob has already blessed them, with blessings that were believed to come from the Lord himself. And Joseph has no desire to go against the will of God. Now, with all of these loose ends tied up, we will come to hear about the passing of Joseph and the end of Genesis. Joseph remained in Egypt, together with his father's family. He lived a hundred and ten years. He saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, and the children of Manasseh's son, Machir, were also born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. God will surely take care of you and lead you out of this land to the land that he promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then, putting the sons of Israel under oath, he continued, When God thus takes care of you, you must bring my bones up with you from this place. Joseph died at the age of 110. He was embalmed and laid to rest in a coffin in Egypt. Joseph lives to be 110 years old, a significant age of blessing and long life in Egyptian culture. And he not only lives long enough to see the birth of his great-grandchildren, but he also adopts them in the tradition that his father had adopted his own sons. His final promise to the family is one that foreshadows their need to be brought out of Egypt. Also, like his father, Joseph asks that his remains be brought out of Egypt as well, but not immediately. He is embalmed and buried in Egypt, most certainly with great pomp and circumstance. But he trusts in the promise that one day the Israelites will leave, and at that time they will take his remains. He will not symbolically return to the promised land until the rest of his nation does as well. What are some of the theological themes that we can discern from these narratives? The book of Genesis is quite literally about life and its origins. And while most of the stories have certainly centered around the lives of the Israelites and their ancestors, there's also been a number of stories about death and the reverence with which it is handled. Many anthropologists consider the care and burial of the dead to be one of the earliest signs of religious thought. Even if there was an uncertainty about what actually happened to one's spirit when they died, to be buried with one's loved ones was an important ritual and even a moral obligation for the family. This was seen for both the Hebrews and the Egyptians. They may not have agreed on their gods, but they did respect the importance of burial rites. As we have seen in the above story, the grand funeral procession was ultimately about honoring a life. Pharaoh and his people did not know Jacob, but they did know Joseph, and they knew of his wisdom and goodness. He was able to represent the best of his family and bring honor to them, even to his morally questionable brothers. Because of his example, his father was honored as well, as we are told in Psalm 127. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Another theological theme that we see in the story of Joseph is also one that runs throughout Genesis and acts as a way of summing up much of its meaning. In the ancestor narratives, we are often shown that promises delayed are not promises denied. God is playing the long game. This begins with the command to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Later, this command becomes a promise, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all told that they will indeed have a great number of descendants. God is life, and he allows his creation to take part in that role. When they disobey or fall into wickedness, life and the capacity to bring forth life is taken away. Look at the flood, Sodom, and Judah's sons. And this is why Abraham and Sarah were so concerned that they could not have a child. It was seen as a punishment or curse from God that somehow they were no longer part of God's plan. 
but God assures them and their descendants numerous times that he will fulfill the promise. We have the same situation with the promise of land. Again, humanity keeps losing the best land, the garden, the pre-diluvial world, and the cities of the plain. And of course, our heroes find themselves outside of the promised land for decades, like Jacob in Padan Aram, or Joseph in Egypt. And finally, the famine seems to make even Canaan uninhabitable. But we should know by now that God intends on keeping his promise, even if it will take generations for it to come to fruition. We see this again when the prophets begin to speak of a Messiah. That too will take a long time. And what might this mean for us today? And while the exact expression, God's time is not our time, is not explicitly found in the Bible, it certainly is implied throughout, and in these verses from Second Peter, in which he expounds on Psalm 90. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. This speaks about both patience and forgiveness, and gives us two reasons to hope. First, in the times that we are the most in despair, or that we think that God has forgotten us, we can be assured that God still has a plan and will not go back on his promise. Often it's easy to see in hindsight, but can be very frustrating in the moment. And it may even require us to trust that the plan may not even be about me, but for my children and their children. The lives of the patriarchs were tough, but God assured them that they were laying the groundwork for something greater than themselves. That's difficult in a world in which everything is about me right now. The second cause for hope is that God also models patience. Joseph waited decades for his brothers to repent, and it was only through divine providence that they even had the opportunity. But Joseph, as an ambassador for the Lord, forgives them. God is patient with us as well, as the psalm says. And it is never too late to turn to him and receive his forgiveness and grace. Before closing out today, thank you for watching. And a special thanks for all of you who have journeyed with me throughout our study of Genesis. And for me, it really has been quite the journey, as I've learned so much about the Bible, but also about production. And you'll appreciate that if you've seen any of my earliest videos. But from here, I hope to jump to the New Testament and start reading the Gospels, or at least one Gospel before going back to the Old Testament. Don't worry, there's a method to my madness. And I do hope that you will continue to join me as we continue to study the Bible. So until then, thank you so much, and be patient with each other as God is patient with you. God bless.